Buy my novel, Escape from the Village, from major booksellers online. Go to escapevillage.com. Subscribe to my Substack. Go to fountainheadforum.substack.com. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the party, pal. This is Fountainhead Forum 120. I'm talking with Carrie Gress, who is uh, the author of The End of Woman and a few other books on feminism. We're going to talk about the early history of feminism. Uh, how are you, Carrie? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. How did you uh, get into this? <laughs> um, well, I initially wrote a book called The Anti-Mary Exposed, which really looked at feminism from the, the second wave on. And, um, you know, in that book, I just really talked about how, you know, these aren't women that have sort of slipped away slightly from Christian moral principles. But in fact, they're actually completely off the reservation. And really, there's a, a diabolical element to it. So um, this was really kind of a follow up to it, but I wanted it to be secular. I wanted it to have a much broader audience and not just a Catholic audience. And so um, I initially thought I would do kind of second wave on. And then um, I, I thought, you know, I just need to go back and do the research on the first wave. I hadn't spent enough time there. And so um, doing that research, I really realized that the, the problems that feminism has didn't just start with the second wave. I mean, they were exacerbated then. Um, but they were really embedded in the movement almost from the very beginning. And that that was the amazing thing, because I'd always been told, you know, the second wave kind of went its own way and, and made a radical break from the pure feminism, which is actually good. And so I think that's kind of how most people understand it. And then, um, like I said, when I got into the research, it was like, no, that's not the case at all. When do you when, when did first wave feminist start, feminism start? Um, it's technically dated from about the 1780s or 90s with Mary Wollstonecraft. She's considered largely the the godmother of grandmother of feminism. Um, but I don't think that, you know, all the pieces really came together. Um, well, that the pieces really came together, ironically, under a man, um, under Percy Shelley, who was actually the yeah. son-in-law of Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, but it, it's it, through the 18, 1800s. It's definitely, you know, formulating itself. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was um, huge in terms of just articulating the position um, that was used and for the suffrage movement. And um, yeah, so it, it probably ends that the first wave ends around the 1960s. Probably I would date it with Betty Friedan's book, um, The Feminine Mystique in 1963. Yes. And of course, Mary Wollstonecraft was a, a partner of William Godwin for a while. And they also had a, a daughter Mary, who, mar who married Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, what what can you you know Shelley was a was an anarchist I know and he wrote mm -hmm. uh, you know a lot of us of course had to had to learn about him in our our high school literature classes yep uh, yeah. you know with his poetry I I didn't really know much about his life what can you tell us about him uh, so Mary Wollstonecraft was actually married um, William Godwin they, she, they they got pregnant and decided to marry each other which was amazing because he was a very outspoken anarchist. He didn't believe in monogamy or in marriage. And, and um, so it was pretty, you know, scandalous thing for this man who's had been so outspoken against these things to actually get married. Um, but Percy Shelley comes along and Godwin was always trying to find resources for, of, of money. And Shelley had this estate that he was going to inherit so he could make loans based on what he would inherit, at, you know, when his father died. And so they kind of came into this partnership and, and much of Shelley's work was influenced both by Mary Wollstonecraft because he was fascinated by what he called the women's revolution, um, but then also by Godwin. So he took kind of the ideas of both of them and made them into this character that he he made in one of his poems, um, Sithna, who was this first independent woman. Um, she didn't have a husband. She didn't have children. She just, her only relationship was really with Satan, actually. Um, so Shelley is the one that threw this character, you know, as his wife, Mary Shelley's writing about Frankenstein, he's defining um, Sithna, who becomes this idol of sorts for, for those who are really actively in promoting feminism in the 1800s. Yes. Frankenstein is also largely considered to be the first work of science fiction. Mm -hmm. don't, don't get us wrong; we we love science fiction here because it it's there's a lot of a lot of positive lessons that can be learned for it, but get from it. But yes, we but yes, that's also one of her more famous, uh, probably more famous. Just of course, you know that that word has entered our language. It's uh, you know yeah. Yeah. the word Frankenstein. So yeah, you you had said some things that uh, that, that apparently Shelley had some really. Uh, you know, you, I, I know his first wife, Harriet, I believe, took her own life. She did. Yeah. I mean, he was a nightmare. There are so many 
dead women, dead children, um, because he was really a proponent of, of Godwin's ideas of free love. And, um, you know, there, there was no like weighing of the, the, the costs for him. He, um, he met Mary Godwin. That was her name, obviously, before she was married. And they fell in love. And not only did he run away with her, but they also took the, the stepsister, Mary, Mary Godwin's stepsister with them. And, you know, there's all sorts of um, suggestion that there was a menage a trois and all of these kinds of things that were happening all the time. That there got that Shelley's uh, real effort was to sort of break all of the taboos. And, you know, have to, you have to remember, too, that you are also during this era, you know, Godwin sort of is, is the, the god, you know, the grandfather of this idea of getting rid of monogamy altogether. But you've also got um, the Marquis de Sade, who's writing his horrible works, and those are influential upon the, all these younger romantics, like certainly Shelley and um, Lord Byron. We know that Lord Byron had a copy of, of de Sade's, one of de Sade's books. So um, yeah, these are just awful cads. And um, Byron actually was recently, um, I just read, he actually tried to buy a 12 year old girl in Greece. And um, gratefully the mother said, you can keep your 500 pounds. <laughs> I'm not selling my daughter. Um, so there, it, it was this whole romantic era um, of the, especially these poets that were made, you know, it was this idea that I think it is very strong in our own age that you, if you have an uh, imagination that you, you're a very moral person. Um, and that was really first took root back in this romantic era under pe people like Shelley and, and Lord Byron. You said Godwin tried to buy a 12 year old for five no. years. Lord Byron did, who was well, a Byron, good friend. Byron, Byron did, Byron did, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. Godwin didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> so and he wasn't buying children. 500 pounds, mm -hmm. when was that? I, I'm just trying to like think. 1820s. How much would 500 pounds be now? Yeah, I don't even know. The article yeah. I read um, didn't actually do the, the, you know, translate it to current pounds. The, but the yeah. inflation and all that stuff, yeah. I, right. I, I, don't, I don't know. But, you know there was a, yeah, that, and, and tries to buy a 12 year you know, Carrie, there's something else I, I, I know also applies to this today. Male feminists, or as you know, sometimes we like to call them the white knights, they're cover, trying to cover up bad behavior. And it sounds like we see this here with uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's not, you know, I mean, what he was doing, I mean, this the sad thing, too, is that there's you know, both Mary Shelley, as well as her step stepsister, Claire, who ended up trying to seduce and was successful in seducing Lord Byron and having a, a child with him. Yeah. Both of them, and I, I have their, their testimonies in my book, um, you know, they were just devastated by what happened to them sort of because of this, these free love ideas and how destructive it was. I mean, so bo both of them um, lost almost... In Shelley, Shelley's case, she lost almost all of her children. I think one has survived to adulthood. And um, in Claire's case, she had a daughter with Byron. And Byron took the daughter and sent her to convent. And the daughter, di the child died at the convent of some sort of com communicative disease. Yeah. Um, but, you know, these women are just are devastated by the, the loss of their children and realize, like, this just wasn't, you know, they're, they're asking the question, this, was this really worth it? Um, to, to go along with these ideas of, of these men. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, but I think that's the other interesting piece is that that is really became an, a key element. This free love idea became a key element of feminism sort of throughout the first wave and certainly into the second wave, because the question that they're asking is not how do we help women as women? They're asking, how do we help women become more like men? Um, and that, that is is part and parcel of it and so free love has to be be an element that they're adhering to because that's what they see that they they think men have the capacity to engage in and so why why shouldn't women um so yeah that's it's a, a fundamental thread of the whole movement i uh, you know i i think free love has consequences for on both sides uh, I, oh I and i i don't mean to imply that it doesn't for men i yeah. just mean this is the ideal that they're holding up and why when, you know, feminist is, is really all about masculinizing women, not yeah. making them more feminine. Un unfortunately, there are a lot of men who don't seem to think that it does, but I. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh, I, it certainly does. You know, it's, uh, and, and that depends on what's what your definition of, you know, I, 
<clears throat> but it's all and, and you know let's keep in mind too that this was an era where it wasn't uncommon to lose your lose a child to mm -hmm. disease or accidents or whatever it's a mm -hmm. it, i mean even up, even up until world war ii was, you, you certainly would know people who lost a child but yeah <clears throat> and, and you know just a time of of lesser life expectancy but yeah so mm -hmm. uh no and that's true but i think that there's also you know a pattern of, of suicides as well and um yeah. and i think a lot of the the deaths are attributable to you know shelley was on the run all the time he more or less he couldn't live in england because his his reputation was so soured there um so they were living abroad a lot and um you know he was just kind of uh demanding and impatient you know young man who was just a complete narcissist and so one of their children died. She shouldn't have left home. She was, I think, one, um, and she had a fever. And uh, um, you know, her mother talks about how she probably wouldn't have died if she had they had stayed where they were. But Percy demanded that they make the trip to Venice, and it was, uh, I think, on that trip to Venice that the the child died. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of narcissism among feminism in general. In mm -hmm. fact, it seems to be kind of politicized mm -hmm. narcissism. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, so th this was in England, and of course, De Sade. I, I I have read De Sade. Uh, you know, he's very much. A, I think he's very much a product of the French Revolution, which seemed to, which seemed to me, in some cases, you know, we're going to overthrow all the order, not just you know yeah. the the king. Right, which was also <clears throat> Mary Wollstonecraft's position as well. I mean, she was very much influenced by Thomas Paine, and that was you know his yeah. position. So yeah, I I think that's exactly right. Yeah, and, and Tom, Thomas Paine did write about did write about women's rights. It was a you know, mm -hmm. you know and, and 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 to his credit, he certainly you know he certainly wrote about slavery too. He was opposed to slavery to his credit. But yeah, that was a, you know I'm I'm curious to know too. Uh, did uh, did Rousseau have any influence on this by chance? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, all the ideas from the French Revolution and this idea of you know going back to nature and just doing whatever your inclinations prompt you to do is is absolutely from yeah. Rousseau. So no, all of us is springing from the thought the thought of Rousseau for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so, you know, there, there are people that I don't <laughs> mention in this book. I have a PhD in philosophy. I thought no one's going to read this if I go too deep into the, all these philosophical threads. So um, Rousseau, d I don't think, makes much of an appearance. And um, Nietzsche is another one that uh, we ended up cutting out some of his um, work that I had p initially put into it because it just felt like it, it was too inside baseball and wasn't really necessary to to make the, the points I wanted to make. Right. But all of these philosophers were very influential on the on our thinking, which is sort of ironic because most of us don't really know anything about what they what they thought. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's interesting too. It, it seems like the uh, it, it seems like too. There is there. Do you think there's a connection between people who go into creative works and 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 just being more perverse there you know i mean you look at all the actors who you know who play musical marriages and stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah. do you think do you think that it just attracts people who are less traditional or because yeah. you know byron, byron and shelley were poets and poets were the were the were the artists of the day mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a really good question sort of what which comes first because you know there's also that just that cultural milieu is created and then people sort of feed off of it or are drawn to it um, for their own various reasons. But um, yeah, and then it doesn't help when you've got someone like Shelley, who's, you know, making it sound like because he's got this incredible imagination and wants to push out all taboos that he therefore is the most moral of them. So it's, that's a real inversion of the moral order as well, I think, too. So yeah, yeah I think it's a good question. And we also notice too, that there, it, it often seems to be people that we would simply call spoiled brats. Yeah, there's plenty uh, of that. You know, who, ne who never really had to work because they had all this money given to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and sadly, I mean, one of the things that I discovered, it was, a, it wasn't really spoiled brats. It was, it was broken women who um, were the problem. Yeah. Percy Shelley uh, was clearly a spoiled brat. I mean, that was absolutely part of his, his biography. Well, um, but women, someone like Mary Wollstonecraft was not, she was a, a, a broken woman. Someone, um, you know, there's throughout the movement, you find these women, who have suffered some kind of abuse and, you know, invariably the answer is not, well, how do we shore this up? So other women aren't hurt. It's more, how do we get rid of that, you know, piece of society altogether? So women aren't get hurt, don't get hurt. That's kind of the idea that they have that they, you know, it's this continued yeah. liberalization and getting rid of structures instead of reforming them or seeing that, you know, people should behave better. A trauma response. Yeah. So, so what, when did this 
so this happened in Europe. When did this spring up in America? Did they have any influence um, in America? Or? Yeah, no, it's hugely influential upon um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton really positioned herself as the foundress of the suffrage movement and the women's movement in the United States, despite the fact that she, there were others that could, you know, easily vie for her, um, that crown. She, but um, she was, very, and she did it very intentionally. In fact, she and Susan B. Anthony didn't meet till after the Seneca Falls Convention, which was, you know, they're really the, the kickoff of the movement, I, I suppose you could say. Um, but, but Susan B. Anthony wrote her, wrote, or Susan B. Anthony was written into that history, even though she wasn't actually there um, because Elizabeth Cady Stanton wanted it, them to appear to be this team that had was from the very very beginning, um, but no, at, Katie Stanton was absolutely a follower <clears throat> of Shelley, even if she didn't really realize it exactly. Um, part, partially because she she had abandoned her Calvinist upbringing and became very anti Christian, and adopted this um, sort of quasi religion uh, called Theosophy, and that w involved all these occult ideas. She was also very much involved in the um, the new, or I'm sorry, the Great Awakening in the United States, where you've got all of these um, mediums who are doing seances, and and um, you know there was this in New York State, there was this big thing about tables rapping when you called on the spirits, and that's actually it was at a spirit table where she got the idea for the Seneca Falls Convention. So um, there's very much this layer of occult happening um, that's involved in it, and then um, finally she's also really interested in this this idea that came from Shelley of rewriting Genesis three. So getting rid of Eve, um, you know, re giving Eve a makeover, so to speak, like she no longer was she tempted and, and fell with Adam, but in fact, the serpent was actually giving her an opportunity. And she grasped at it because the serpent was the source of knowledge and wisdom. Um, so there's, there's that, those pieces that definitely came from kind of European influences, specifically Shelley that she grasped onto. And, um, you know, she ended up becoming such a lightning rod that she actually got kicked out of the own the, the group that she had founded for women's suffrage. Um, so suffrage didn't happen again, didn't happen for 30 more years because of the scandals that she and, and Susan B. Anthony were involved in. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, was were, It seems though this might have been a product of some of the transcendentalism that was happening a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, were, were, Emerson, were Ralph Waldo Emerson or Henry David Thoreau involved by chance? Or? You know, I don't um, recall seeing them involved in it. Um, yeah. I, I don't I don't feel like that was something that they really touched on. I, I'm not saying that they weren't. I just haven't seen the evidence of that. It didn't, I didn't come across it in any of the biographies of them being engaged in that. But of course, that was the whole milieu. I mean, before the war, um, I, I think there was something like 2 million people that were involved in kind of this occult spiritualism. And after the war, especially as everybody's trying to, you know, contact the dead because they've lost so many husbands and, and fathers, um, it really surged to about 7 million. Um, but you can see the connections with transcendentalism too, because it's um, spiritualism sort of takes out the middleman. You know, there's no more pastor or priest necessary or required. But you know, when you have a medium and you're working directly, you're speaking directly to the spirit, so to speak. Um, you know, women no longer needed men for guidance spiritually either. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's it's kind of all of a piece in a certain respect, even though they they wouldn't agree on everything. Do you think sometimes there there might be an overreaction to you know say like a the, the, they they come from these really puritanical strict homes and you know and and then and then they're rebelling against that maybe even they had a bad experience with a priest or something like that I mean um no I don't know I mean I think in in Katie Stanton's case she's another one of those women who's sort of a, you know is very spoiled she in fact at one point she was trying to, ar to articulate what grievances women should have against men and they, she had to ask her husband and her friend's husband because she just didn't have him at her fingertips I mean this was supposed to be her whole bread and butter was her her Seneca Falls convention and the grievances of women and she can she couldn't even articulate them <laughs> Um, you know, one of the men actually mocked her like your grievances must be great if you can't <laughs> you can't bring them up. Um, you can't create them yourself. So I, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't there. And each person is different. But I think more than what we see in Katie Stanton, we see sort of this this brokenness, um, uh, you know, like in a Mary Wollstonecraft who had horrible parents who had 
um, you know, was a, abandoned by a lover when she was pregnant. She tried to commit suicide twice, you know, on and on. The story is just dark and painful. Um, so that's a more common thing, especially when you get to the second wave, um, a lot more broken women. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the Seneca Falls was in 1848, which seemed to be one of those, one of the more revolutionary years in the history of the world. world. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, upheaval in Europe and mm -hmm. no, nothing really in America happening but Seneca Falls and the, a lot, a lot of Europeans left Europe because of failed revolutions there. And mm -hmm. just, a, it was a very interesting time. So, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, so yeah. And I, I know also to their credit though, I think a lot of the feminists were also, uh, able, were also wanted to abolish slavery. Isn't that right? I mean, that did yeah. And that's that. also where Elizabeth Cady Stanton yeah. differed. She, um, I mean, they started out as abolitionists, but then she had all this resentment that, um, that, that, the slave, the black men and, and Asian men and Italian men would be able to vote before she, she could. Um, so that created another divide between her and her group and another group of, of feminists um, was that racist, racist aspect, which also doesn't get a lot of airtime when people are promoting feminism. Yeah. And cause, cause I think, cause Frederick Douglass apparently got involved with some of these suffragist movements after, mm -hmm. after, after, after his work was done. It seems like, you know, mm -hmm. Well, once once your work is done and your your cause wins, what do you do? You go find another cause. Although I think Frederick Douglass, I, I, I think Frederick Douglass was truly a great American. Though I don't think we can, and prob probably the greatest African American in, in the history of this country. But yeah, so at least one of them. Yeah. So, uh, you you know uh, another thing too that uh, you you don't hear it talked about much, but you can kind of put two and two together and. You, and I, I realized a long time ago, a lot of the feminists were also very much involved with the temperance movement. I mean, it's not an accident mm -hmm. that the eight that they're the 18th and 19th amendments. Yeah, you know, yeah. outlawing alcohol and giving women the right to vote. And mm -hmm. yeah, which yeah, no, I think it's um interesting to sort of look at these trends and I trends and I, I didn't spend any time on the temperance movement. Um, I, I think I was more interested in like, what are the household names of feminists that, that we know? And, and, you know, if you're going to read some sort of um, textbook history book about feminists, you know, who are the names that are going to be there? And um, there's really those years that I, I think we don't know the names of, of those women's women. And part of it is, is because they were sort of focused um, seemingly on different things, you know, the free love aspect, the occult aspect, and this, um, you know, uh, egalitarian element were, were not as strong, I, I think, in what they were f focused on. They were focused on really those specific goals and those other key things that end up sort of marking fem the feminism of Katie Stanton and, and um, later, especially, you know, once you get into the communist era of feminism. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's some um, kind of these different threads, but it's the bi the bigger piece is, you know, where's how is this narrative come down to us and and why are these the women that are are selected as the, you know, the grandmothers of the movement instead of the temperance women? We don't we don't know what their names are, you know, that kind of thing. True. Yeah. But there is definitely a well, I know, you, you know, uh, yeah, just but I don't think it's an accident that they. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And, uh, you know, the whole thing, you know, but, you know, it's like, oh, how do we get, you know, it's it's certainly well known that, you know, if men get drunk, they're more likely to hit their girlfriends or their wives. I mean, we, we know mm -hmm. that, but, you know, it's like, oh, instead of just, you know, policing the violence, we'll outlaw alcohol, which was kind, right. kind of, which is, which was the, as I've said it, the, the dumbest thing that a democracy ever did before 2020. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. It was done for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, what? Where do you think? Uh, you know, you you talked about the communism where and Marxism. Do you think Marxism entered the picture pretty soon here because it seemed like it was starting to? Yeah. No. This idea started to take off after after the Civil War, which uh, mm -hmm. to to the detriment of the whole world, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, Thomas Paine, I, I think, is considered the first socialist, and. Um, you know, the world was really just on fire with Marx's ideas. And then what, what you know, you look at this Soviet communism after the Bolshe Bolshevik revolution and who, um, what do they do to women? You know, women go, are sent to work. Women are no longer in charge at home with their children. Um, and abortion is legalized. 
and made free. So, you know, you couldn't own a stitch of property, but you could get an abortion at any time you, you wanted to. Um, it, was, it, was the, it was kind of birth control for them. Um, so that's the, the pattern that was really established is, and, and I think we can see that, you know, women in, in the culture today have been tr trained to think like Marxists, not to think like uh, authentic women. And much of that came directly through Betty Friedan. I mean, you can see that there's a, and I chronicle this on my book. I mean, there's definitely a thread of this blending of feminism and Marxism. Um, the, there's this group called the Congress for American Women that was in the um, uh, 1940s that ends up getting uh, disbanded by the House Committee for Un-American Activities because it was so obviously a, a, a um, propaganda piece for the Soviets. But you had all of these women, including Betty Friedan, who were involved in it and um, very influential women, both academic women, um, the wife of Gumbel's um, department store was involved in it, all, all kinds of very influential women. And um, so this is really where Betty Friedan got a lot of her ideas for the feminine mystique, because in the feminist mystique, she I think she in intuitively understood that women, if you told them in America to follow this Soviet model, that women would say, you know, absolutely not. I'm not going to you know, go to work and let somebody else raise my child and um, just keep aborting my children. But in fact, she couched it all in very, you know, highly psychological language and made it look like um, this was actually a benefit for, for women to become, you know, to work like Marxists because her real goal was to get women to do be doing productive work outside the home. So she called the home things like the comfortable concentration camp and she made women, you know, think that they were missing out on something and just really painted this really awful, awful picture of of home life. And, you know, it sold this book sold over three million copies in the first several years of its publication. So uh, in, in any event, I think she was ma really masterful and she also disguised and hid her communist roots, um, it, you know, almost completely. I think she did. She said she wasn't interested in women's issues until the 1950s, which clearly not the case. We know there's articles that she published about feminism prior to that. So anyway, that's really where the blending happened very, very subtly, but I think um, in a pronounced way. And that's why, you know, we can't really articulate what a good woman is now, but we can, the idolized woman that we have is sort of this self-reliant um, working woman. And that's, you know, what we see in celebrities and throughout, you know, laced throughout the culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gimbel's Gimbel's department store, which was which was certainly a, a big deal at one time there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I I do find it it, it does seem that uh, you know what what do you think people who those who desire free love what do they want they just don't want any they they just I wonder is it is it maybe just that they never grow up or what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think there's so many different answers to that because um, obviously there's those who are just, um, you know, the Epicurean, they're just seeking pleasure and self-gratification. Um, I think, yeah, there is there is that sense of um, not growing up, but I think the cultures really made it, in many respects, kind of a toxic thing. And, you know, I was just talking about this yesterday with a, a friend about how, um, you, you know, we've marriage has been made very unattractive because we've made women, you know, we've, we've encouraged women to be in control and powerful. We've told them that they're never wrong, that we have to believe everything that they say. And so that nobody wants to enter a marriage like that, where, you know, the man is the idiot and has no voice like that. There's nothing attractive about this inversion of order that, that we've created. So I think that it's, you know, it's, there's probably all these different tentacles, but um, it, the impulse itself, especially in the 1800s, came from this, you know, breaking taboos and tearing things down and sense of destruction and, and freedom. But I think now it's bled into just so much brokenness on personal levels that, you know, it just becomes almost untenable for people to even maintain monogamy because of all the different things that we've been told and experienced culturally. Yeah, we we've now created a system where it's getting just getting very difficult to to even get married and have children, and it's really. Yeah. And you know, the state has picked up where husbands used to have a role, and that's you know we saw this with the Obama administration and his that that Julia person that they invented, who never needed a man, you know, from her from birth until death, that the government was going to take care of her, and I, you know I talk about this extensively, like this has affected 
most in most ways, most respects, it's affected the poor where they become married to the government. It's a, um, this this uh, term called bureaucracy. Um, so that that's the real sad thing. And it actually becomes kind of a status symbol to be the kind of woman that has the capacity to get married um, when you get out of that, you know, the lower classes. You know, not to mention we have what, at least in America, we have now what 20 or 25 percent of women are using some type of prescription psychoactive drug now. I mean, yeah, yeah. whether it be Zoloft or Xanax or or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or whatever, and they're all. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think that's a result of feminism. The statistics show that women are not happier than they were before feminism. And of course, you wouldn't know that on the face of it, but that's what the, all the studies are showing. And it's, you know, we're, we're becoming more medicated. We're not becoming happier. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, you know, it's, you know, I see it a lot on social media, you know, and I, and then sometimes I'll see, you know, some of the, and what's really sad too, is I, I, I think, I know some women who get and start maybe to get into their thirties and they realize I've made a horrible mistake here and, mm -hmm. and, and it just becomes harder to correct them. It's yeah. good if they can ha make, realize that mistake in the thirties. I think, you know, I meet so many women that don't realize it until their fifties or sixties. And then, you know, it's at the point where they, their fertility is no longer available to them. And, you know, that's really a tragic and sad place to be that they, you know, they bought into everything that feminists told them to do. And um, it's clearly hasn't, you know, made them happy, especially I know one woman, you know, became very real to her when the bottom fell out of her career. And, you know, at that point, she was like, well, what do I have? You know, I have nothing. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just been incredible to see that kind of isolation that it's created. And we can also see that real desire to still continue to, to mother, um, you know, that's what's being stripped from us biologically. And, but I think women are meant to mother others, not just biologically, but also spiritually yeah. and psychologically. Uh, <clears throat> So this is why we have that really a pet craze. You know, there's seven and yeah. seven hundred million dollars on pet costumes each year. Um, and that's oh, I know. Yeah, the the yeah the yeah the and you know I and you know I love I love dogs as much as anybody, but the but the this there's almost been this deification of of pets mm -hmm. now. It's yeah because they're taking know. place of children. You know, we're meant to have rich relationships. Um, in our families and yeah. in the you know nuclear family, and when you take that away, that desire doesn't doesn't go away. Um, so yeah, we've absolutely found surrogates to to fill in the gaps or fill in the holes. But of course, they're they're surrogates that are you know not going to be able to actually do the real the real thing. Yeah, and you you, you know, the stereotypical crazy cat lady, you know, too, not mm -hmm. just the... yeah, yeah. yeah. I will. I, I will never understand either why you would ever have more than two of a pet. But you know, it's. A, <laughs> you know, it's I don't have an answer for that. You, I don't know. You, you get a second one because you know they, they'll keep each other company. But then after that, you just you, you also get up. You know, you get up where they start to form gang. They kind of form little gangs and they have rivalries and stuff like mm -hmm. that. When you get more, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. They're. I mean, and and do dogs are absolutely wonderful. I will always. I, I love dogs, but. You know. Yeah. So yeah, and and sometimes it's birds, or sometimes it's other things, you know. Too, and, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. What is it that somebody just tried to get a support alligator into a baseball game? I, th <laughs> I tried to say it was a support animal. That's that's the well, you the that's the weird part. Well, you know, of course, mm -hmm. you know, there's also the the curse of the billy goat when the guy wanted to take a billy goat to a, Cub, a Cubs game. This was back back in the forties. Mm -hmm. Probably people. wasn't trying to say it was his support <clears throat> animal. Yeah, but that, that well, that was a World Series game, you know, and the and the Cubs and the Cubs lost that World Series, and the guy and they call it the, the guy said the Cubs aren't going to win anymore because of this. So, so they and because the Cubs didn't win, they actually did talk about the curse, of the and and that was a man who did that. So it was right, right, right. But it's still rather a, a funny story. It's a so yeah, I I've noticed too. Uh, yeah, uh, the the growth of rather, uh, I mean, I, I actually was in a, in a group one time and I asked, I said, if, if a woman has a snake, is that a red flag? <laughs> you know, what was the answer? Uh, they said yes, but yeah, yeah. I, 
<laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah. So it's, uh, you know, you certainly know it's, uh, uh, when one guy, I don't know, he, he read this book. He said, he said the biggest red flag though, women who love horses, but only, oh, only, beca only, only because they're, they're a lot more expensive and a lot more work to take care of. But yes. Ah, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. But uh, I've never owned a horse before. So I, uh, I, I, I yeah, so, you know, you know, it's interesting too, that there was always a connection with this in communism. Do you think maybe that was just a way to subvert the whole system here? I mean, um, in what sense? I mean, the, just, it, really, in order well, to have, communism into the United States, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, it was a way to implement yeah. communism because they couldn't oh, they couldn't implement communism by attacking attacking the system directly. They had to undermine it in other ways. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and that's why I think Fredan was so successful using the psychological tactics that she used rather than coming right out and saying it. And then you see definitely much more of the aggressive communist language coming out with someone like Kate Millett, who, um, you know, Kate Millett was a, a student of Wilhelm Reich, who actually in the 1930s wrote the book called um, The Sexual Revolution. So he's the one that sort of created the blueprint for the destruction of the United States with the sexual revolution. And she and Angela Davis were really those who helped implement it. Um, these are not, you know, soft and, and soft and, um, you know, peddling their their arguments with the kind of um, flattery that that Fredan used. These are very militant women, and and Millet was very much um, she she believed that women had to be every bit as as aggressive as men. And she thought, you know, as the Vietnam War is going on, she's saying, you know, all these men are killing innocent people in Vietnam. Um, we should be women should be str just as strong in killing their own children through abortion. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it goes from something very, um, uh, you know, appealing with a book like this, The Feminine Mystique um, to something much more aggressive and, and um, you know, militantly communist in the second wave, for sure. What do you think attracted, uh, it seems like so much of this comes from, you know, what, what, you know, it was poets in the 1800s, but now it's, in the nineteen the nineteen hundreds and later, it's always college professors. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the Frankfurt School. It's the new yeah. left. It's the way they they were smart about it, and um, you know, they they were infiltrated the the universities and realized that if you get the young, then you eventually get everybody. I mean, this is kind of the same idea with the women. If you get the women, um, even more so, you get you get everyone. Um, because the woman is the really the cornerstone of the family. And if she doesn't want a family, then there's no family. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, all of these these elements are certainly woven together. And, and you can see this, you know, with the women's movement or I'm sorry, the women's studies programs in the ac in academia, which were in many ways promoted by Kate Millett and other feminists who, who were trying to get yes. different ideas into into the schools. And they're now even, you know, coming out with these men's studies program. Of course, they're completely just, you know, about demonizing men and and, oh, and making up other and saying other silly things. You know, it's a oh wow, I, I haven't heard of the men's studies program yet. Yeah, of course, really, it's it's just about demonizing men and how they can turn men into women because uh, yeah, it seems. Oh, to be okay. Yeah. yeah, it really does seem to be this whole entire revolt against nature, which. Uh, yeah. And it is. I mean, that's really where Nietzsche comes in, this idea of the Ubermensch who can make him, re you know, invent himself into whatever he wants. Um, that gets perpetuated by Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre and their existentialism. And um, so, yeah, without feminism, we would never have gotten to the woke transcendental or I'm sorry, um, um, trans craze that that we're living with now it's all it's all root and branch totally connected and and the iron ir irony of all this is now the the trans movement is actually on the verge of really destroying women's sports and other things like that mm -hmm. it's uh yeah I, I mean i know a lot of a lot of feminists you know it's there seems to be this you know this constant where you keep moving to a more extreme position and then, and then they end up eating the less extreme. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know what? Yep. I think that's exactly right. And so we're kind of at this loggerheads because with the trans movement, obviously that's really split 
feminism and um, it's sort of eating, eating itself. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where it goes from here. It's kind of scary <laughs> to think about where it goes from here. I don't. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, the one nice thing is it feels like people are finally waking up to it. You know, they're seeing this, you know, forced sterilization of children and saying, this has got to stop. I mean, this is a, this yeah. is a permanent transformation and, it, you know, having the detransitions the transitioners speak out is helping. I think once the, those people start suing, I think it will probably yeah. will end because the, the medical people and the corporations will not want to pay, you know, have more payouts. And that's what's yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, if, a, if an 11 year old wants to get earrings or paint their mm -hmm. fingernails right. or, 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 you know, or, or get a crazy haircut, it's a, another mm -hmm. thing when you're doing something that really can't be reversed and they're, exactly. And there, there's, yeah. So uh, do you, do you have, how do we get out of this? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of afraid this could end up that there's eventually going to be a real hard, hard backlash against this, which won't, which mm -hmm. could be, you know. Well, I mean, that was some of the motivation for writing this book was just to help people understand the, the roots of it and and what has happened to us how deeply we've been indoctrinated because this is the way the way that most women think today comes from these ideas and these are all perpetuated by elite media i mean if you think about think about the number of women that that are on the left that we know you know just by their first name um think of how many conservative women that we know just by their first name there's almost not anyone um it's so the the left has taken over the culture and has really shoved this narrative down our throats in such a way that we don't even know how to think outside of this box generally. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's the real challenge is to try and help women realize like, OK, they they've set up the terms, which is their way or you're a, you're a handmaid belonging to a fertility cult. And you should just put your red robes on like that's how they've also articulated their the op, what they what they want people to think is the opposition. So that those binaries are the ones that we sort of have to break out of because that's not really what real womanhood is on in, in any form. Um, so go ahead. And I, I know one woman, you know, I had one woman on here who's really great. She's, you know, had, she talked about her hippie parents and all this stuff. Yeah. And she said, mm -hmm. you know, I I'm traditional. I'm, I'm committed to my husband. She says, yes, I'm a rebel. It's yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's become that right. <coughs> We're the new hippies. I, <laughs> so I, I have a, committed to my husband and have children. So yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing how far it has, has gotten. But I think too, there's also that element of people are waking up because pain has a, a remarkable way of getting people to pay attention to things that they normally would not pay attention to. So um, anyway, yeah. I'm hopeful, but I think it's a, you know, it's a very long and hard road. And I think also, you know, feminism has been really kryptonite to men. It just makes men do not have a voice in, in the movement really at all. And um, and they should, but because of the fact that they've they've found a way to really silence men, um, it's really incumbent upon women to to speak out about it. And um, sadly, that's yeah. that's not happening very much. Yeah. Did you did you do any a, a deep dive into the history of divorce law? Because I, I that, you know yeah. that, that would be something just to just to see, mm -hmm. you know, how easier you know how because I've. I, I know a guy who lives it who lives in Mexico. He's married. He just had a baby, and he said he said to me, he said, I, "I love Mexico because if my wife leaves me, she gets nothing." Mm -hmm. And and you know that you know that's a, that that was and and you know you look at some of these. It, it does seem as though feminism does does become a luxury for the rich, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. once they get the money. So, yeah, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't look into that. Um, <laughs> But I think they're all interesting questions because, again, the goal is to make a woman independent, self-reliant, um, and it, she doesn't need a family or a man. So I, I think that the, the laws have definitely followed that. And um, so we, we've got to work it out for us, for sure. And, and it seems like some cultures have maybe more guardrails in place or things like that that prevent this from happening. For example, mm -hmm. I, I don't hear, for example, about any any feminist movement in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. So wh wh what are they doing there that that makes the system work? I, now, granted, Japan is also going through a major baby bust. 
Yeah, but that's what still. I was going to say. And that's the fruit of the feminist feminist movement too. Is I mean, that's exactly why they're going through the baby bus because they're not they don't value the you know having children. So I think that it's probably there, it's just hidden in, in different ways. But um, you know, there's certainly there's there's a, something to be said for different temperaments and and society. You know, we we think that the Japanese have sort of more of a a guarded public presence, uh, you know, there's sort of a, a, yeah. a mm -hmm. focus put on um, being quiet and, um, you, you know, all of that. So I think that those have to be taken into account too in different different aspects, but that doesn't mean that the poison isn't there, which of course is what yeah. we're seeing. And it, Japan is also just a very, uh, I would call just a very traditional and conservative country. They, they, they just, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't change unless they're kind of forced to, you know, so. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've always done it this way. We're going to keep doing right. it this way. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but some people also, I've also heard theories that if you have a language uh, that has, uh, you know, gender, that puts gender on nouns, which, uh, you, you know, which yeah. I, which does seem kind of silly to me as an English speaker, but, uh, you know, most of the, you know, Spanish, Portuguese, they have, you know, you have the masculine noun, the feminist noun, like, you know, my house is La Casa. My house is a feminine noun, but my car is El Coche. So my car is a masculine noun, right. which is, I, I don't know how that, how, what the whole point of that is, but maybe there's some purpose to that. It's mm -hmm. Well, it certainly makes it harder to change pronouns and things like that when you're m much more actively focused on yep. kind of masculine and feminine um, attributes, which, you know, Italian and French are the, the same too. So yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think it's all really interesting. I do go into a little bit about that, like some of the feminine nouns that are are used in the end of the book, and just look at what are they and what 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 do they do, you know. So I, I think that's um, an interesting aspect of those like what that language is can inform us about um, in terms of what is considered masculine and feminine. But obviously, it's not a hard study. Yeah, and, and you, you certainly you and yeah, and, and it does impact English. You know, M Mario is a man. Maria is a is a right is a is a woman. You know, it's a mm -hmm. the, o, the a. That's usually how it how it works. Uh you know, it's a. Uh, is there anybody else we we missed? Or I mean, certainly Betty for Dan. I mean, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I think we hit all of the the early women. That's that's um. Yeah. That's for sure. It's um, yeah. And the second wave, I think people are, are more familiar with to a certain degree. But again, they're just carrying on these ideas um, in a much more militantly Marxist kind of way. You know, I, I've also heard, too, that apparently there there was so much with abortion not only being legal and subsidized, that there was so much abortion in the early Soviet Union that it was on the verge of possibly wiping itself out eventually. Yeah, they had to change the laws because of the fact that there too many people were having abortion. They just had no, their fertility rate just took completely. Yeah. So it's like China. Yeah. Like China. You know, th this is the thing that, you know, I, and I do consider myself a Darwinist. And ultimately, the only thing Darwin cares about is that you keep having kids. <laughs> and, 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 you know, yeah. You, well, you have, we, you have one child. We have five or six children. It's a. Mm hmm. And I, I, I don't, yeah. Yeah. The perpetuation of the species is a lot easier when yeah. you've got multiples. Yeah. But as Aaron, Aaron Clary also likes to point out, you know, the, the number one cause of poverty is people having kids who can't afford them. But, so. Well, I think there's also that element of uh, the, the broken family and all of that, because there's yeah. nothing better for a child than to come be born into a situation where there is a father and, and a mother who love each other. So I think that's oh, yeah goes a long way. I, I think definitely that's important. You know, we certainly hear, you know, uh, you know, men in prison or, you know, didn't have dads around and things like that. It's a. Uh, yeah. You know, so. I think that's the bigger cause. If you don't know how to live life, you're not going to be able to live it well. And that's what dads yeah. do. Yeah. And, and we're certainly seeing some experiments here too, you know, I, uh, and from what I'm hearing also is that, you know, uh, uh, are you familiar with Erin Pizzi, who uh, was an English woman who opened the first domestic violence center in England? Mm -mm. Uh, she's often said, you know, I said, I, op I opened this domestic violence center and then I soon realized something. The women were as violent as the men. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. I have to look her up. 
So that's great. Well, I'm afraid I need to get moving. I got to get back to my five kids. So uh, okay, yeah, love those five kids. Yeah. So uh, yeah, say, <laughs> give them what, what's the age range? Uh, thir- uh, 14 down to three. Okay. Well, well, that's great. Uh, thank you for coming on here, Carrie. Uh, so, uh, you got a website you need to tell us about or where we can find you? Uh, they can go to theologyofhome.com or carriegrass.com. Theologyofwhat.com? Theologyofhome.com. Theologyofhome.com or carriegrass.com. Okay. Car- thank you, Carrie. Uh, please like and subscribe to the video. Uh, check out my Substack. Go buy my novel, Escape from the Village. This is Chris Baker, and we're out.